So today is Pentecost, and those of you that know me know that Pentecost is right up there with Epiphany. It is so excited. It's just one of those days that just resonates, and it's hard to hold it inside because can you imagine walking out and seeing 3,000 people out there? And what's even better is that they're speaking 3,000 different languages, and as you walk out and you see them and you just go, this is amazing, and then all of a sudden you go, one, two, three, and they're all speaking the same thing, same language. They're all understanding in their own language. How exciting that would be. I can remember going over to the Holy Lands and having the opportunity to um, spend a worship service in there, and when it came time to do the Lord's Prayer, there literally were people from all over the world in that worship service. And the pastor instructed us to speak the Lord's Prayer in whatever language was our home language. And it was truly a Pentecost moment. I mean, just around me, I heard French, and I heard Spanish, and I heard English, and I heard a lot of stuff that I didn't understand at all, and I just thought, this is just spine-chilling. It was so fabulous to have that opportunity. I want you to look at a slide now that I have up there. Who knows what this is? The seal of the United States, yes. And in his uh, little mouth, he has a sign that says E Pluribus Unum. And it's printed on all of our currency. And I looked, I pulled out every different kind of currency I had in my billfold and it was on all of them. It's Latin and it means out of one, out of many, one. It was designed by Charles Thompson, the Secretary of the Continental Congress, and it signifies strength, unity, and independence. It was passed by the U.S. Conference, Congress in 18, 1782, and the purpose was to bring diverse groups of people together and make them one in a united assembly. Sounds like something the church does, huh? Brings a whole bunch of people together and unifies them. Here's some fun facts. In the eagle, the talons and the arrows and the olive branch, you see down there at the bottom, those signify war and peace. War with the arrows and peace with the olive branches. The original bird was not the eagle. Benjamin Franklin wanted it to be the turkey. So we could be gobbling all the time. In the Wizard of Oz, the scarecrow gets his diploma from E Plural Unum University important knowledge to have there. <laughs> the 13 is used repeatedly throughout this symbol for the 13 colonies of the United States and who can guess what they were? Do you remember the 13 colonies? Delaware, Delaware. Delaware. Massachusetts. Massachusetts, Virginia, North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. North Carolina. yeah, yeah, New Jersey. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, Maine didn't make it. Connecticut. Connecticut. That was the last one. Yeah. All right. Connecticut, Delaware, Georgia, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey. There's a lot of new there. North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, and Virginia. All right. So there's 13 stars in the crest, 13 stripes on the shield, 13 arrows in the left talon. 13 olives and olive leaves in the right talon, and 13 letters in the motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of one many. There is your history lesson for today. Out of one many. In our gospel today, Jesus is with the disciples, and he's offering them peace. And this actually takes place on Easter Sunday. He has died, he has come back to them, and they are afraid. They do not want to leave. They are paralyzed. So he says, peace be with you, and he brings on them and asks them to receive the Holy Spirit. Now this is where I get into this theology nerd stuff, and I think it is so cool. He uses the word enu fusen, and it's the only time he uses it in the New Testament, and it's Greek, and it means to exhale. And the only other time it is used in the Bible is its sister word in Hebrew when God picks up the earth creature out of mud and he 
exhales life into it. How cool is that? It's only used twice, once when God is exhaling life into the earth creature and once in the New Testament where Jesus is exhaling life into the disciples and giving them the Holy Spirit. I just think that is so cool. So there's a concept here that's called social death. And this was the first time I had heard this particular word used this way. And social death is when you are paralyzed because of your circumstances. And that's where the disciples were. They were paralyzed because they were afraid they were going to be killed if they went outside for being a Christ followers. So throughout history, it's the ability, inability to give a full-throated voice to one's identity, to have to hold back part of who you are. And it's experienced in history as slavery, as captivity, or as marginalization. The disciples lived in fear because they found out they were afraid if they were found out that they were Jesus' people, that they would be crucified. But Jesus' breath transforms their fear as they are given the Holy Spirit. In our second reading from the book of Acts, we're transformed a mere seven weeks after Jesus' death. So we go from Jesus' death in the gospel and the day of, and then we go to seven weeks later, which is Pentecost, which happens to be 50 days because penta means what? Five, 50. So it's 50 days in Pentecost. So we're still in Jerusalem. So we are in Jerusalem for Jesus and the disciples being up in the, the room, and then we're 50 days later, and they're still in Jerusalem. But the reason they're still in Jerusalem is because there were three big Jewish celebrations that they had, and this is Shavat. Have you heard of Shavat? Okay, so Shavat is actually the feast of, for the harvest. And so this is so cool, too, because they're there for Shabbat, the Feast of the Harvest, to bring stuff from the harvest, to put it down, the first fruits of it. And the idea is if we give God the first fruits that come out of our, our harvest, then what God's going to do is make the rest of the harvest be really good. We're going to get the right amount of sun, the right amount of rain, the right amount of everything else. And so it's on this celebration, this Feast of Harvest, that God sends Pentecost, so with these 3,000 people, God's going to grow this amazing church. With 3,000 people, God grows this amazing church that's last over 2,000 years. Now that's some return for your offerings, isn't it? <laughs> wow. So it's so exciting that this is happening on this, this Pentecost day. And there's another word that I want to lift up, and it's called the theophany. And theophany is, theo is God, and ophany is to show, so it's to show God. And so when Moses goes up on the mountain and gets the Ten Commandments, what we're told is that there's this loud noise, and that there's fire, and that there's wind. And we're talking about when Pentecost happens, there's the show of the Holy Spirit, and we see fire, and we see wind, and we hear a loud noise. So again, the original, yes, it was written on stone, of the Ten Commandments, again, is a picture-perfect thing on Pentecost. What happened on the, the Mount Sinai is happening again when the Holy Spirit comes. I just love these connections between the two that way. So what we have at the time in this point is we have the social death and the stifled breath because the people before the Holy Spirit came couldn't talk to each other. Their, their languages were mixed. They couldn't figure out what one was saying, and then the Holy Spirit comes, and suddenly they can hear in their own language. So again, the stifledness is taken away. And then we go into our first reading, which is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And by this time, the church has gone from Jerusalem, which is in Asia, and it has gone over into Europe. And in Europe, we are sitting in Greece, 
And so this is where Paul is talking to the church of Corinth. He is sending this letter to the church of Corinth, and he's saying there are so many different spiritual gifts that everybody has, and you are not going to believe this, but the church of Corinth, there were actually people there complaining and saying that their spiritual gift was better than another. Can you believe people would act that way in church? That people would say, oh, the music department is more important than stewardship, and stewardship is saying, no, if you don't have money, then you can't have music. I, people would never behave that way. But they sure did in the church of Corinth. So Jesus is, um, Paul is writing them this letter saying, what we need to do is we need to work together. There's no gift that's better because all of you were given these gifts. And it's up to you to use these gifts, but these gifts come straight from the Holy Spirit. And those of you that are familiar with Martin Luther's small catechism, you will know that in the third article of the Apostles' Creed, this is immediately what came to your mind, right? <laughs> that the third article of the Apostles' Creed said, we cannot come to God by ourselves, we can only come through the Holy Spirit. So we see the Holy Spirit working in the disciples with Jesus' exhale of breath. We see the Holy Spirit working on Pentecost with the Holy Spirit coming in through the breath. And then we see the Holy Spirit working again with this church in Corinth because they did turn around and they did start working together because we wouldn't have been here because it went from Corinth all the way out from Asia, it went into Europe, and then it went down into Africa and it went all over the world. So we have one body and we have many parts and we're going out there to make a difference and here the holy spirit is exhaling in the internal life into the people of corinth saying there's not one better than the other that we all need to work together because i want to give all of you eternal life so the people in corinth had to die to pride they had to die to selfishness and they had to die to arrogance. A concept, again, referred to as social death or stifled breath. It's the inability to give a full-throated voice to one's identity experienced throughout history as slavery, captivity, and marginalization. E pluribus unum, out of many one. Out of many societal deaths comes one life in Christ. In our scriptures today, we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to the disciples to unify them with peace when they were slaves of fear and how the Holy Spirit united the church to become one on Pentecost when they were slaves to language barriers and how the Holy Spirit united the church of Corinth when they were slaves to arrogance, selfishness, and pride. E pluribus unum, out of one, many, out of many, one, out of many societal death comes one life in Christ. Oftentimes, we that are privileged don't realize how our privilege blinds us until the Holy Spirit comes and opens our eyes. Sometimes we don't even realize that we are blinded to the societal built things that affect other people. Last week, Danny and I and Karen were at Senate Assembly. And they were trying to let us vote on apps on our phone, but the technology didn't work. I know, can you believe that technology <laughs> not working? So they had to go old school and they pulled out these cards that said yes on them that were green for go and no that said red for stop. And so when they said what we were gonna vote on, they would tell us to get our cards out and get ready to do that. And so we were sitting on the third row back. Good Lutherans didn't want to sit on the front row. But apparently that hadn't been taught to the Hispanic population because they were all on the front two rows. Made us feel comfortable. So the Hispanic population's there and the bishop out just offhandedly, he said, okay, everybody, we're gonna vote. Go ahead and get your green cards out. And you could hear this gasp from the front two rows. <laughs> and they were honestly scared. And they said, nobody told us we had to bring our identity with us. Because a green card to the Hispanic population says if you can be here or not. 
And the bishop, you could see it in his face. He's going, uh, he knew he had offended or he'd scared them more than anything. It wasn't offending, it was scaring. And, he, and then he goes, I am so sorry. And so after that, he was very careful to say, get your yes and no cards out. <laughs> but we don't even realize what we're doing when we do it. Because we stifle people's voices and we don't even know we're doing it. Not even on purpose at times. Sometimes it's on purpose. But we have a tendency to do that because we just don't understand. And it happens in all walks of life. It, it happens for people that are bigger than other people. It happens for people that are smaller than other people. It's not about hair color or eye color or skin color. It's about it not accepting people the way they are. And Jesus is going, the Holy Spirit came for everybody. Christ came for everybody. This is not just about a few. Together, we work together and we make one. I can remember the first time I came across the phrase, the words, the alphabet, I'm not sure what you want to call it, of LGBTQT plus, question mark. I honestly, I, I knew what part of it meant, but I didn't know what all of it meant. So I called my husband and I said, have you heard of this? And he said, no, I've never heard of this. <laughs> so we called our almost 40-year-old son who's a pastor and said, can you explain this to us? And he knew what it was. He knew that the L stood for lesbian, that the G stood for gay, that the B stood for bisexual, that the T stands for transgendered, that the Q stands for questioning, that the I stands for intersex. And I said, wait a minute, I was following you till then, but what does intersect mean? And he said, it's an adjective used to describe a person with one or more innate sex characteristics, including genitals, internal reproductive organs, and chromosomes that fall outside of traditional concepts of male or female bodies. Do not confuse having an intersex trait with being transgender. Intersex people are assigned to sex at birth, either male or female, and that decision by medical providers and parents may not match the gender identity of a child. Not all intersex folks identify as being part of an LGBTQIA plus community. And instantly I said, ah, one of my very, very, very good friends from a very, very, very long time ago, we're talking almost 50 years, her first child was born with this. And she had to, within 24 hours of having her very first child, decide if this child was gonna be male or female. He had ovaries and he had testicles, but he didn't have, they had to decide immediately how he was going to urinate because they had to go in and, and automatically make that. So that's what intersect means. Then asexual, and asexual again, a, the person just didn't experience attraction to males or females. It, it's just, it's not there. And then there's non-binary. And these are people that are not male or female. They may use different terms to describe themselves. Sometimes they're called gender queer or agender or bigender or gender fluid. These terms don't mean exactly the same thing. It's just kind of a group that's put in there. And then there's the pluses. And these signify all the gender identities. Some people just want to be thrown into a plus just because it's easier for them. And so then our son went on to tell us that in today's version of 1 Corinthians 12, that it would read, just as one body has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, heterosexual or LGBTQ plus I, Anglo or person of color, we are all made to drink of one spirit, e pluribus unum, out of many one. Out of many societal death comes one life in Christ. 
E pluribus unum, out of many, one. It is the crest on the United States. But do you know where it came from? Anybody know where this came from? At the time it was made into the crest, it came from the Gentleman's Magazine of the early 18th century. And in this Gentleman's Magazine, every year they would do a special issue that was compromised of the best articles for the previous year. And so they would call this the E Pluribus Unum Magazine. So Pierre Eugene Smetir originally suggested the motto in 1776, but it goes back even further. It's found in St. Augustine's Confession Book Number 4, in case you want to go home and look it up, and that was in 397 to 398 after Christ. Then Cicero in 44 BC used it, discussing the nature of a family where the individuals came together to make a better family. But e pluribus unum, the thing that is written on all of our currency as people in the United States, and what all three of our gospel messages, or our readings are telling us today, that as many we are better as made one, comes from drum roll. There you go. A recipe that Virgil wrote down in 19 BC for pesto. <laughs> if you took all of these many kinds of elements that go into the pesto together, they make it a really deep green color. E pluribus unum. Many things making it better in one. So to all of you pieces of pesto out there, so it's in a confession, a family union, and a pesto. When things come together, they are equal and better than individually. And our scripture talks about that. All of us, every person in this room, has experienced a time of feeling that your voice wasn't heard. We've all experienced a time where we just couldn't get the words out that we wanted to because we felt like we weren't being listened to. We as a church are a place where all people are called to be welcomed and all people are called to be listened to because out of many together, we are better as one. And all God people say, amen. amen.